Hey, what's going on? This is Trip Lee, and I am super excited to be in Southeast this weekend, and I am preaching on Hebrews 11. We're talking about faith, the role it should play in our lives, how that should change who God is uh, making us into. So I'm super excited for you to hear that word, and I'm praying the Lord to use it to change us. Hey, welcome to Southeast Online. My name is Mike, and I am so glad that you're here. Hey, before we get going, let me say what this is. This is church, which means this is a community of people who gather on the weekends because we love Jesus. We want to love each other well. We want to love our community well, and we want to learn about God's Word. So that's what this is. Welcome to Southeast Online. Welcome to church. I'm here at our Crestwood campus this morning. We are gathered all over the place. Tia is at our Blanket Baker campus. Good morning, Tia. Hey, Mike. Good morning. And good morning to all of you. Um, I love what Mike said, that this is church. And so one of the ways that we are the church is that we connect with each other. Uh, we get to know each other. We pray with each other. And we would love to do that with you. Um, so we actually have a really simple way for you to do that. All you have to do is text the word CONNECT to 733-733. And someone from our team would love to reach out with you. They can pray with you. They can answer any questions you might have, help you get connected here at church. It's gonna be great. Yes, absolutely. Please do that, guys. We've got a special guest with us this morning. His name is Trip Lee. You might recognize that name from his music, from his books, or from the fact that he's been here a couple times before. We love having Trip with us, and he just has a good message this morning about faith and faithfulness and how we can grow in that fruit of the Spirit. Yeah, I'm so looking forward to, to hearing from him, uh, learning from him today. Uh, so something really exciting happened this past weekend. We had our Shine Fall Fest. We actually have a video for you to see, so check that out. So my favorite thing about Shine Fall Fest is being together with my friends and my peers and getting to see like what Jesus is going to do. Shine Fall Fest makes me feel awesome and it makes me feel loved. Hey church family, we're here at Shine Fall Fest. As you can see, there are hundreds of people that we get to love on and there's so many of you that came out to love on our Shine folks. I can't think of a better way that our church gets to love people one person at a time. Well, the Shine Fall Fest really was the church being the church, loving our brothers and sisters and having so much fun. Um, and it didn't just happen here at our Blankenbaker campus. It happened at multiple campuses um, across the city. And so we are actually going to hear from some people that were at the, at the Shine Fall Fest this past Friday. Um, and so would you stick around after service? We have Mike and Sarah and Derek with some of our participants, our guests, our staff, our volunteers that are going to get to share with you a little bit more about what happened this past weekend. Well, right now we are gonna head into worship. And so my challenge to you is to lean in, take some notes, um, worship with us, hear what the Lord has for you today. I'll see you guys after service. Come on, you sing. Hey. My God will finish what he started. He holds the world within his hands. My God delivers on a promise. Nothing's greater than him. My God will break down every stronghold. Jericho walls will stand a chance. My God can conquer any giant. Nothing's greater than Him. Nothing's greater than Him. We sing. The victory is yours. Though the battle in a... Come on. The glory is yours, amen. With hands lifted up, I'll be singing through the fire. That my God, He's not finished yet. God is with me every moment. No powers of hell can hold him down. My God to death to resurrection. Nothing's greater than him. It's true. Nothing's greater than him.
that's true of you, you sing, come on.
Man, grab a seat. So this weekend we're talking about faithfulness, and when I think of faithfulness, I I literally I have one guy in my mind. It's a guy named Billy Graham. You know who that is? Um, he preached to roughly I think like 220 million people live, not counting radio and TV and all that. And of the 2.2 roughly million people that made a decision to accept. Christ live in those meetings and over the course of his years, my mom was one of them, right? And so um, I've, yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah. And so um, I've just watched his life and just how faithful he is and how faithful he's been. And it's just, it's a deal for me. I wanna be faithful like that. And so funny enough, we're talking about faithfulness in this last week, I got time to spend at this place called The Cove. It's the Billy Graham Center, and they do all this pastoral equipping and training uh, just literally for the whole world. It's such a neat place in Asheville, North Carolina. And um, I was helping out at this conference, and so I got to eat all my meals with some of the Graham family. And so I'm sitting at this table. This is such so bizarre. I'm sitting at the table with uh, Gigi Graham. It's the oldest daughter of Billy and Ruth. And I'm just sitting there and I, you know, I told her, I'm sure she's had a million people tell her about my mom and just how that changed. And she's, you know, tearing up. And then she starts just telling me stories about Billy and Ruth and their family. Y'all, I'm just like soaking it in. I'm drinking it in. And she looked at me and she said, you want to hear the last, you want to hear the last full sentence my daddy ever said? And I was like, girl, come on. So she's like, so, you know, he was getting weak. It was at the end. And as we were, she said he just wanted, I understand this as a father with one daughter and four boys, he just wanted his daughter holding his hand, right? So she would just hold his hand and he would lay there and she said he would doze off and she'd about to slip away to do something. He'd just kind of open one eye and be like, honey. And she's like, I'm here, daddy, I'm here. And so she said one, she said uh, the last full sentence, she said I uh, had to sneak out and I just had to do something. And she said, I got to about the door. She said, and he just woke up and he caught me and he was like, honey, She's like, yeah, daddy. And he's like, you need to come back here. So she's like, okay, daddy. She came back and she held his hand and she said, he just looked at me and she, she said, he said, honey, you need to focus. She said, daddy, what do I need to focus on? He said, honey, you need to focus on the cross and the person of Jesus. You need to focus. She said, and those were the last words, the last full sentence my daddy ever spoke to me. And I thought a couple things, right? I thought, A, my daughter better be there in the end, hold my hand, right? Um, And then second, I thought, man, I, I, I pray, Lord, that I'm the kind of man that in the end, no matter what life I've lived, that I can do very little but to point to the cross and the faithfulness of the person of Jesus who's been my life. That... It's why we celebrate communion every week because we can get caught up in a million things and we have to remember to focus on the cross and the person of Jesus. So if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, that's why we do this. We can't ever forget who he is and what he's done. So let's take communion together.
And God, we love you. And we are so glad that we get the gift to come together and worship you. That we get to declare your name and your goodness and your grace in freedom and in confidence. That we get to sing those words that you are holy and you are on the throne today, tomorrow, and every day after. Jesus, we thank you for the cross and we thank you for the love and the faithfulness that you show us when we lack it. Keep our eyes on you. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. It's in your name we pray, amen. Y'all can grab a seat. Hey church family, this weekend we are continuing in our series on becoming becoming the person God made us to be. And each week we've been talking about a fruit of the spirit that gets produced in us when we keep in step with the spirit. Uh, As we learn about the fruit of faithfulness today, I'm excited for you to hear from Trip Lee. Trip is a pastor, a teacher, he is a well-known hip hop artist, and he is uh, one of the most requested guest speakers that we have at Southeast. I have been thankful for the way he shared with us in the past, glad he's back. And I'm especially glad he's preaching on faithfulness because I've seen this fruit in his life and ministry, even when he has faced some pretty difficult and challenging circumstances. So um, his life as a follower of Jesus exemplifies what it looks like to faithfully serve. And he's gonna talk to you about how we can grow in faithfulness. I'm really glad he's here. Would you please welcome back Tripoli. Good morning. It's uh, good to get to be with you. That's very kind of him. And uh, I've really enjoyed the times I've got to be here and share God's word and uh, excited to get to preach this morning. So I'm going to pray and then we'll, we'll jump right into God's word. Father, we come before you again in Jesus' name. Father, and we thank you so much for your word. Uh, Father, we're we're grateful for your word because um, we could gather in a room like this and just talk about stuff and sing words, but none of it would mean anything if it wasn't the actual living and breathing word of the living God. Father, we come in this room in a variety of different places, some of us wrestling with different stuff, some of us distracted, but God, we pray you would grab our attention. You know what we need, and we pray you would speak to us, and we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this morning, I would like to talk about faith. I want to talk to you about faith, and it is uh, an interesting time in our culture to be a person of faith. Faith is um, not seen as cool by people. Faith is not uh, one of the characteristics that people most admire about people. If you ask kids, hey, what do you want to be like when you grow up? Not a lot of them are going to say, I would like to be a person of faith. That's not a thing that grabs people's minds right away. Matter of fact, the, um, the way that our culture thinks about faith is as if it is more strange, out of step with the way that we think about the world now. I, w- I want to read a few quotes about faith to help us see how people can sometimes think about it. It says, one of the greatest tragedies in mankind's entire history may be that morality was hijacked by religion. Or this one, religion is, because it claims a special divine exemption for its practices and beliefs, not just amoral, but immoral. Religion poisons everything. Or this last one, it says, every day people are straying away from the church and going back to God. You know, if you look at stats on faith in our country right now, um, the amount of people who think about faith as one of the most important parts of their lives is plummeting. People who go to church regularly is plummeting. There's a, a large rise in people who they call the religious nuns, people who have no particular faith that's important to them at all. This is a interesting moment in our culture for faith. Not everybody's angry at faith, though. Some, 
Some people um, may think that, you know, they're not angry at people of faith, but they do think that faith is something that is outdated. You know, something that's like, you know, faith is for a time when we didn't really understand the world. We didn't know what was going on around us, but now we do. That's just strange. Or still other people who think of faith as it's a fine thing, but they would put it on a list of other nice things that you could have if you want to be a notable citizen. You show up to work on time, and you, um, you don't let your grass get too long. You mow it, your grass is looking nice, and you're a person of faith. But the way that uh, the writer of the Hebrews, and we're going to be looking at Hebrews 11, talks about faith is as if it's a lot more than that. Because the writer of Hebrews is going to tell these Christians that they need to live by faith, not just with faith, not with faith as one of the things on the list, but to live by faith, that every area of their life will be lived out by that faith. And someone may say, but why would he, do, why, why would he need to say that? If he's going to say, hey, don't stop uh, uh, gathering together around Jesus because that's what keeps your faith alive, or to encourage each other, that's what keeps your faith alive. Isn't faith just a crutch? Why would it be that important? And here's one of the things I want to drive home is that faith is not a crutch. It's more like a stretcher or a gurney. And here's why I would say that. You know, with crutches, you know, you still got one good leg, so you just need the crutches to kind of help you hop along. Whereas without faith, we are completely helpless, hopeless, no way to get to our destination. Faith is more like a stretcher or a gurney in that it carries us to the one who has everything that we need. It connects us to God himself. So with that in mind, we're going to look at three things that we learn about faith, why it's so important, why it's more of a stretcher than a crutch in uh, Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to look at it in three points. The first one is this, that faith gives you sight. Faith gives you sight. Y'all with me this morning? All right. Now, we all uh, understand the importance of sight, right? What we see is the way we navigate through the world. It gives us security, too, that we know what's going on around us. You know, there's a reason that kids are afraid of the dark, because they can't see what's around them. And they imagine that whatever strange creature that they saw in a Disney movie is lurking in those shadows. But when we can see, we can see what's going on. It's not just seeing physical things. I mean, just... Having a sense of what things are, seeing is important. You know, even um, there's a reason why if you want to buy a house and you're trying to get a loan, you can't just say, hey, um, no, I got got the money. I'm good for it. They say, well, no, sir, we need to see your tax returns. You can't be like, no, 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 I'm I'm a man of my word. I'm good. (laughs) No, no, no. They need to see with their eyes. They need to see pay stubs. They need to see, they need to make sure that money is there. There's a reason why if a case is being argued in court, they need to see evidence of the crime that's been committed. Because when we see things, it lends more credibility. Now, you may say, Tripp, what does this have to do with faith? Listen to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. This is what God's word said. It says, now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen, for by this our ancestors were approved. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. Now, that sounds like a worldview that we're not really familiar with, and in some ways sounds at odds with sight, that faith does. So you may say, Tripp, I think you got your point wrong, saying that faith gives us sight, but but I'll tell you what I mean. When he says, faith is a reality of what's hoped for, the proof of what's not seen, that is a definition uh, of faith, Though it's not a comprehensive one, it doesn't tell us everything we need to know about faith, but it gives us a good guide. It's kind of like if I said, um, you know, uh, Jessica is my wife. That would tell you something about her, just not everything. There are other great things about her, like that she has great taste in husbands. You know, there's <laughs> other important things about who she is, but it does give you a window into who she is. This definition of faith is a really guide, a good guide for how to understand it, because I think a lot of the ways that we think about faith in our culture are False. We, we often think of faith as kind of a hoping or a wishing. You know, something that just kind of makes you feel better about a circumstance. Like you may say, I haven't been going to work, but I have faith that I'm going to be able to pay my bills. I just feel it in my gut. That's not faith at all. What Scripture is going to talk about here with faith um, is much more than hope or wishing or even something that we just receive as tradition from our family. Um, the other way that, that, that our culture, you know, 
they think about people of faith, they would think that's a strange way to see the world or to come to conclusions. And it's understandable because most of our culture's beliefs rest on this assumption that, you know, everything that we know is true, we know because we can see it or we can do an experiment on it, experiencing it with your senses. But the writer of Hebrews is trying to tell us that not only is faith in God respectable, but it is a more sure way to move through the world. The writer of Hebrews is saying not only is faith respectable, but it's a more sober view of reality. And I just want you to know, I don't mean just any faith, because faith on its own is not a virtue. Have you ever thought about that? Faith is only as good as the object of the faith. So, for instance, I grew up in Dallas. I'm a Cowboys fan. Every season, I just feel it in my gut, and I'm like, this is our year. I have faith we're going to the Super Bowl this year. And yet, at the end of each season, we're eight and eight somehow. That faith was not grounded on good things. Faith is only as good as the object of it. And, and so Paul is not, I mean, uh, you know, like Paul says, if Jesus didn't really get up from the grave, I'm someone to be pitied. We're not talking about faith as something that just makes you feel nicer. The writer of Hebrews, if he's told them to live by faith, when he says... It's the reality of what's hoped for. If you've heard this verse before, you may have heard the assurance of things hoped for, this confidence. And he's saying that sometimes we, we, uh, there are things that we hope for that we can't see with our eyes. And what he's saying to us is that faith shows us what our eyeballs don't sometimes. That there are realities, very real, substantial things that we can't see with our eyes, but our faith shows it to us. It could be faith in future promises of God, this faith in invisible thing, an invisible God that you can't see with your eyes. One pastor summed it up well that faith gives substance that isn't reality yet. Faith gives substance to something that isn't reality yet. People of faith and, uh, are, are those who build their life on promises that haven't been fulfilled yet, that I know God is with me even when I can't see him, that I know I've been given a new heart even though I didn't have any surgery, that I know that I'm filled with the Spirit even though you can't measure it with some kind of medical device, that I know that God is the creator of all these things around us. And it's strange, though, that he would talk about faith as the proof of what's not seen. But again, faith shows us what we can't always see with our eyes, and we always build our lives like this. It's really a question of, uh, of what we live by faith in. Everything we do, we do based on what we believe, even if we can't see it with our eyes. And, and the reason is because we trust credible sources. You know, for example, I, um, I, I, I flew here to Louisville on an airplane. And I believed when I got on that airplane, I was going to land here safely. Let me tell you, it's not because I checked out the plane for myself. I did not get under that plane. I wouldn't even know what I was looking for. I'd be like, yep, there's some metal. Yep. <laughs> but it's because I trust those pilots. I, I trust those engineers to do that job. Well, I trust them. And when we have good reason to trust credible testimony, then we, we build our life on that, even if we haven't seen it for ourselves. And this passage is a testimony to the credibility of God. One, that he goes through this list of all these heroes of the faith and how God was faithful to them in difficult seasons. I mean, uh, you, you should read Hebrews 11, the whole chapter, if you get a chance. But he brings up Abel, and he brings up Enoch, and he brings up Noah, and he brings up Abraham, and Jacob, and Isaac, and he brings up Gideon, and on and on and on. And there is this faithful God who has been faithful to them over and over and over and over again. Testimony from credible witnesses. But not only that, another way he gives us this credibility right away in verse 3, he says, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. Right away, he undercuts any worldview that dismisses things that can't be seen. Because he says, the things we can see were created by unseen right? Um, so that seeing is not always the best indication of what's real. And part of the way we know that is that our eyes can deceive us sometimes, right? Even, you know, if, if you're at your house and you, you think you see someone lurking in the shadows, but it was nothing at all. Or you're talking to someone and you see them make a face, and then you go through the whole day thinking that they hate you. And it's like, I finally did it. I pushed them away. And then at the end of the day, they're like, nah, my stomach just hurt when we was talking. And then the conversation was over. 
Our eyes can deceive us. And we trust ourselves too much sometimes as the absolute final judge of everything that's true based on what we can perceive and see with our eyes and ears. And so there's sometimes when we could think maybe the Word of God isn't worth building our entire life on because it's invisible. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, just because you cannot see it does not mean it's real and it doesn't mean that it's not powerful. I dare you to show you something visible that is stronger than the invisible Word of God. That God spoke and created everything. That God holds the universe together by the word of his power. All the visible things that seemed so strong came from the power of the words of an invisible God. So I don't want you to allow anybody to make you feel foolish for building your life on the word of God. I don't want you to let anybody make you feel foolish about depending on this word of God. And I don't want that to to impact your own confidence that that it can uphold you just because you cannot See it with your eyes. It's the Word of God. And the thing is, the alternative is not that we don't live by faith. The question is, will we put our faith on things that can actually hold up what we put on? Some of us are building our lives instead and living our lives by faith in the security of our jobs. Building our faith uh, instead on the security of our closest relationships on our skills and gifts. And what I want to say to you is um, your financial statements are not sturdy enough to hold the weight of a human being made in the image of God. And when we build our lives by living by faith of the promises that those things give us, it would be like putting a, uh, a little Lego chair that my son made with Lego blocks and then sitting on it, it would not hold my weight. And it would be on me for assuming that something so flimsy could hold the weight of a human being. I want you to know we cannot live by faith in things that cannot hold up the weight of a human being made in the image of God. But God, on the other hand, is faithful and he's good and he's strong and you were created to build your life on faith in his promises. But it is hard, though. Because there is so much that we do see with our eyes. Even when it comes to believing in God's future promises, sometimes we think, but I don't know how to do that because everything I see looks hopeless. How am I to believe that God is actually at work? And sometimes we think, man, if I just could have been in Bible times and I could have seen Jesus with my eyes, I want to remind you there were people who looked Jesus in his eyes and told him he's not who he said he was. There were people who were present and they saw Jesus and the disciples show up with five loaves of bread, and then they saw thousands of people get fed and still didn't believe that Jesus is who he said he was. I need you to understand that the key to you building your life probably is not just you seeing everything with your own eyes. There's still a heart that has to see that Jesus is who he said he is. Romans 10 says that faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And so one of my encouragements is to build your life in a way where you are um, exposing yourself constantly to what God has to say, to God's word. That's what awakens and, and strengthens that faith in our hearts, reading God's word for ourselves, being with other people who encourage us with God's word. The number of times that I've been talking to someone and said something dumb, and my friend was like, well, actually, God's word says this. I mean, the, the number of bad decisions and bad perspectives the Lord has saved me from that way. Before I go to the next point, I just want to give three, three disclaimers about this faith. First one is, I don't think this text is calling for a completely blind faith, a faith that just says, oh, cool, that sounds true, that has no questions, that has no curiosity. I think he's not saying, uh, uh, you know, live by faith even though you haven't thought about anything. I think instead he's saying, I want you to trust what you have seen. I want you to trust how God has shown himself to be trustworthy. For me, part of what that is, is that Jesus got up from the grave. So even when I'm um, wrestling through things, I'm like, but if Jesus got up and showed himself to 500 people that saw him face to face, and then the guys who were following him, who saw him die, then went on to uh, dedicate their whole lives to telling people about this Jesus to the point where they were even murdered for it, each of them, 
Well, that to me seems pretty credible that he got up from the grave. He's not saying don't think about anything. He's saying build your life on the credibility and trustworthiness of God that you have seen. Second disclaimer, I'm not saying throw out science and throw out all ways to see and observe. I'm just saying that all truth is not verified by the scientific method. That's, there's not only one way to know things. There, um, there's no experiment to do that shows us what love and courage looks like in a human heart. And the third thing that I want to say here quickly is that um, this doesn't mean that we will never wrestle with doubt. That's kind of faith we're talking about. I do not want people to come among God's people and think, man, I am the only one who ever doubts anything that God has said. Whoever wrestles with how to understand particular things in Scripture. I don't want you to think that just because you wrestle with doubts, it doesn't mean saving faith cannot also exist in your heart. And also, I want God's people to be a safe place for people to wrestle with their doubts. I don't want anyone who's unsure of anything to feel like I can't be amongst those people. They would never receive me because I have questions. Instead, I want to be a safe place that encourages people to do what, what uh, the man in the Gospels did when he saw Jesus, where he said, Jesus, I believe, help my unbelief. When I wrestle with unbelief, when I wrestle with my doubts, I want to take that to Jesus and say, Jesus, help me to see you more clearly. Faith gives us sight. Y'all still with me? Number two, faith makes you righteous. Faith makes you righteous. Now, if you were to ask random people on the street, hey, do you want to be righteous? They would probably say, uh, uh, probably not. It probably sounds strange to them. You know, part of it is, we, you know, we have twisted views of morality and goodness in our in our culture, or maybe what they think of as like just weird people, or people who are disconnected from culture, or prudish, or strange, or uh, hypocritical. Scripture thinks about righteousness a little differently. Listen to uh, verse 2. Well, he's just talked about faith, and he says, For by this our ancestors were approved. By this, meaning faith, our ancestors were approved. And that's not usually how approval works. It's not usually by faith. Usually, approval works by showing who you are and the, the things that you've done. If, if you want to, I don't know, get into a school, you'd be like, hey, will you approve me to be a student at this school? Look at all these amazing things. Look at these grades. Look at these accomplishments. Look at these things I did just for the sake of this conversation. Look at all of that and let me in. But what he's saying is God was pleased with them based on their faith. Of verse 5, talking about Enoch, it says, by faith Enoch was taken away, and so he did not experience death. He was not to be found because God took him away. But before, before he was taken away, he was approved as one who pleased God. Now, without faith, it is impossible to please God, since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Again, Enoch is the only man in Scripture who didn't die, who was just floated away into heaven as a reward for his faithfulness to God. And still, what the writer of Hebrews says is, no, 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 what actually brought God pleasure about him was his faith. That's why he was approved. You think about Abraham in verse 17. It says, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. And the thing it also tells us that we don't see in Genesis is that um, it says that Abraham's faith was counted to him as righteousness. And this is Isaac who, I mean, this is Abraham who, you know, God came to him and said, hey, you're going to have these descendants, you're going to have a son, and Abraham and his wife are like, are you sure? We're uh, like, I don't know if you noticed, Lord, we're quite old. And God was like, nope, yes. And so he has a son, and then God says to sacrifice him. Abraham trusted God so much, the Hebrews tells us, he assumed he was just going to raise his son from the dead. He was like, surely God is not going back on his promises to give me descendants, so it must be that he's going to raise him from the dead. It's that faith that was counted to him as righteousness. And the reason I'm making these points with how he's talking about it is we always assume that the way to be approved before God as righteous is to do a bunch of good works to show him how good we are. What Scripture tells us is you could never be good enough to meet that righteous standard. God is not interested in you performing for him over and over again, that we are sinners. And that's not how we become righteous. Instead, that righteousness comes from God by faith. Now, of course, that does not mean that our good works have nothing to do with our faith. 
Good works are a symptom of the faith that's inside of us. It's like getting a virus. It's like when COVID really showed up and you were around and somebody coughed anywhere, you were like, bro, you better go cough over there. <laughs> now, of course, coughing doesn't, didn't give anybody COVID, but it's the, uh, the, the person is coughing because it's already in them. In the same way, when that faith is in our soul, it's not that the good works connect us with God. It's that because we're connected to God through faith, those good works show up. It's a symptom of that trusting that God is who he said he is and will do what he said he will do. We're righteous by faith. Paul talks about this in Philippians 3, where he says, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. And he talks about being found in him. Paul is always talking about being found in God, in Christ. He's saying if we want all the spiritual blessings, they're found in Christ. He's saying if you want to know where you need to be to be blessed, it's not in this building, it's not in your house, it's in Jesus. That's where the forgiveness is, is in Jesus. That's where the deliverance is, is in Jesus. That's where the salvation is, is in Jesus. That's where the real joy is, is in Jesus. That's where the righteousness is, is in Jesus. We do not want to face this holy God outside of Jesus, but if we stand before him in Christ, we are seen as righteous. So Paul says, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. He's not giving us two options for getting right with God. He's saying if you're going to be seen as righteous, it has to be given to you. It reminds me of this uh, time. Uh, many, many years ago, I was at a show, or I was uh, headed to an event. I needed a rental car. Went up to the rental car place and I gave the lady my card and she swiped it and then she furrowed her brow and she leaned forward and said, sir, your car got declined. And I was like, nah, do that again. <laughs> she did it again and she kept swiping and I started to get defensive at this point even though she didn't do anything. I'm like, ma'am, I work hard to provide for me and my family, <laughs> right? Just unnecessary. And my friend is like, bro, I, I don't know what's going on, but it's fine. Just use my car. And I was like, bro, you go stand over there, okay? <laughs> I work hard. And here's what's happening is, like, I can get her to keep swiping over and over again, but for whatever reason, the money that was supposed to be in my account isn't there. If I am to get this car, I'm going to need somebody else to give me money I don't have on my own. And here's what it's like with receiving righteousness from God. Our righteousness account is absolutely empty. There is a moral bankruptcy that we cannot get over on our own. And yet, there is the Lord Jesus who lived the absolutely perfect life. And what Scripture says, if we put our faith in this Jesus, then his perfect righteousness account is applied to ours. That's how righteousness happens. And it's his faith that makes us righteous. And not only in terms of how we're seen before God, but it also shows up in our lives. Because if you look at all these uh, people they, they mention, right? He says, uh, by faith, Abel brought God a better offering. By faith, no one when warned about things not yet seen built an ark to save his family. By faith, Abraham when called to go to a place. Um, and he goes on and on and on. And I'll say this, if your faith only exists in your mind and never shows up in your hands and your feet, you should ask if that faith has really taken root. Scripture is really clear that faith without works is dead. And we see this faith not only has us be seen as righteous before God, but also shows up in our lives looking more and more like him. Y'all following me? Faith makes us righteous. In verse 6, he says this, Now without faith, it is impossible to please God since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek him. He says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. It is um, a waste of our time to try to just do a bunch of good stuff that would make God like us. And, and I wonder if you've ever thought about the fact that you can do good things from the wrong heart and not please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. And he says, the one who draws near must believe he exists and rewards those who seek him. It's trusting that God is who he said he is and will do what he said he would do. Faith gives us sight. Faith makes us righteous. And number three, faith gives you a future. Faith gives you a future. 
I wonder if you have ever seen something go completely different than you thought it would. Maybe on paper, it looked really good, and then it just didn't work out that way. Maybe it looked really bad, and it went even better than you expected. This is the thing about being human beings who don't know all things. There are a lot of times situations look very differently to us than they will actually show up. Even when we make great plans, um, you know, even when at the beginning of the season, it seems like the Cowboys are going to do great. You know, it goes a little different. Scriptures are really clear that we will have trials in this life. There's no way for us to avoid them. And things will go differently than we expect. And here's what can happen. Um, we can get in a mode where we believe God's promises, that he won't leave us or forsake us, that he will provide for us, that he will give us all of our needs. But then we can get very squirmy and panicky when we don't see those promises fulfilled right away. And that's understandable. Because when we feel like somebody's not keeping their promises, they lose credibility with us. We stop trusting them. But I want you to listen to how the writer of Hebrews talks about all these heroes of the faith in this passage. Verse 13. He says, these all died in faith, although they had not received the things that were promised. But they saw them from a distance, greeted them, and confessed that they were foreigners and temporary residents on the earth. Now, you can understand if some of these people, these men and women in this passage, had gotten bitter at God. Can you, I mean, Moses. Moses could say, God, after all that I did and came after you, right? After I dealt with these horrible people in the desert, these stiff-necked people, after I did thing after thing that you called me to do, how is it as we march toward this promised land, then I don't even get to see it with my own eyes. You can understand if Moses had been bitter. And if you want to read through Hebrews 11, you see so many promises that God had given that not everyone got to see completely fulfilled with their own eyes. But what it says is that they knew that those promises were coming. They still trusted God. Here's the question. Does your trust in God get eroded when he doesn't keep his promises on your timetable? Do we turn into judges overlooking God and saying, God, I know you said you were faithful. However, you made the wrong decision in terms of the time. What we see from them is that they said, I so fully trust this God that even though I didn't receive these promises on my timetable, I, I trust him anyway. My, my, my kids can be like this sometimes. If I say, hey, we're going to do something fun after lunch. The minute that the last morsel of food enters the mouth, if the fun hasn't already started, they feel deeply betrayed. They start to panic. And they're like, well, where's the fun? And they look me in my eyes and they say, Father, you have betrayed me. <laughs> and everything that they know about me as a promise-keeping father gets thrown out the window. All the fun times are all thrown out the window, and they're like, you, sir, are not a promise-keeping father. You are a fraud. <laughs> and it's as if they've forgotten my entire track record, and yet this is how we treat God. As soon as, as soon as he doesn't keep promises on our timetable, we doubt everything that we know about him. We doubt his power. We doubt his faithfulness. We think, God, you said you were a provider. Why aren't you providing immediately? You said, God, you'll, you'll take care of my needs. I have needs that don't feel taken care of right now. As if he hasn't shown his faithfulness and trustworthiness yet. But here's what it says that these heroes of the faith did. It says they waited for him and they greeted them from afar. And not only that, it says um, they confessed they were foreigners and temporary residents on the earth. Part of their ability to stay faithful in the midst of all these trials, and if you read through this, they went through difficult things. Part of the way they were able to stay faithful in the midst of it is they understood this is not their final home. They understood this is not my only chance in this current moment to receive the things that God has promised me. Scripture over and over again will, try to, uh, will motivate us to be faithful and obedient to God based on future promises. Don't store up treasures for yourself on earth where thieves can steal them. Store up treasures for yourself in heaven. Even a verse uh, right after these verses in Hebrews 12, he's going to say, Jesus looked to the joy set before him and it helped him to endure right now. 
you live your life differently and you have different expectations when you realize that this earth is not your final home. For example, I, I am here, you know, staying at a hotel here, and I, but because I know this is not my home, I'm not walking through the hallways in my bathrobe. That would be strange. It's not my house. When I'm in another country, I don't get confused when people speak in another language. I don't get confused when people have different cultural customs. It doesn't offend me. I understand I'm not at home. I don't judge them for, for the food that's different. Except for British people, they eat tomatoes and beans for breakfast. That's very strange. I'm judging them. But other than that, I don't get confused by that because I'm not at home. All of the comforts of home are not here. If I want things like that, I'm going to go back to my house for it. And if we understand this earth is not our home, we won't be confused when all of the comforts that we're expecting don't show up. So much of the suffering from difficult seasons comes from us forgetting that this is not our final home. And that no matter how difficult this is now, Jesus wins in the end and he takes us with them. Like the scripture will say, hey, the stuff you're dealing with now, momentary trials that cannot even compare to the eternal weight of glory that's waiting on you. Longing for that weight of glory will help you to be a more faithful follower of Jesus right now. It will help you to love your neighbor better because you understand, I don't have to be greedy. This isn't my final home. It'll help you risk your comfort because you understand, I don't have to fight for my comfort tooth and nail. This is not my final home. I don't have to step over people rudely for a promotion. This is not my final home. Longing for that final home helps you to be more faithful in this temporary. Faith gives us that hopeful future. And, And we see that example here with them. The the good news of of this faith is this, that all these things we can't do for ourselves, see see all of reality because we can't really trust our senses more than anything, be righteous enough on our own because, because we're sinners, to have this perfect future because we're not in control of all things, all of those things are things that God freely offers us. This is why I'm saying faith is not a crutch. Faith is more of a stretcher where we're carried to the one who has everything that we need. And God is so gracious that he calls us to himself and says, look, you don't have to do all the work yourself. I already did it. Just trust me. And I promise if you trust him, he will show himself over and over again to be exactly the gracious, faithful God that he says he is. Amen. Amen. Let me pray. Father, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus. God, and we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for your son. God, we pray you would use your word to help us to see you more clearly. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room. God, that you would help their faith to grow deeper, more rooted, that you would give us endurance and trust in you. Pray for my friends who don't really know where they are with you. Father, you'd help them to see clearly how incredibly gracious Jesus is and how he connects us to you. We ask all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Anybody need that message? Anybody? Yeah, it was good. Uh, Thanks, Tripp. Really appreciate you being here. And um, let me just say this. So um, I had like a couple hour conversation with somebody that I really love uh, this this past week. And it wasn't somebody, my my brain kind of goes to two things when um, he starts talking. It's like, look, you know, faith helps you see. Faith makes you righteous. Faith helps you understand your future. This isn't our home. And um, that sounds like, and it is, just the gospel message, right? And um, I was talking to my friend, and, and man, he just, he's just really struggling. Not because he doesn't know Jesus, not because he doesn't believe, but he really right now needs Jesus to help him with his unbelief. I started thinking of um, how, and you know, how many of us are just needing a reminder that faith isn't trying to get through life with a crutch, 
trying to rebuild the airplane, but just recognizing that he's, he's just asking us to get on the stretcher. Just say, I trust you. I need you. Um, I, don't, I don't want my mind to just be unplugged. I want to engage, but God, I just need you to grow my faith. I think there's probably more people in here that would say, yeah, faith has been hard recently. I think there's another group of people in here that, um, and I can't imagine it, but I can, who've just never put their faith and trust in Jesus to recognize that we're not asking you to do something weak. We're asking you to examine the evidence of Jesus and who he is and what he's done. And we believe, and you can check it out for yourself, that he has resurrected and that there is life and forgiveness, and freedom and hope and a new home available to you. And all you have to do, you don't have to come up with a resume. You don't have to stick around here long enough to kind of what he said, just come up with a long enough resume that you can finally get into the club. Thank you, Lord. That's not how it works. It's by grace through faith. You say, God, I, I need you. I want to trust you. If that's you today, and I just want you to know to my right, to your left, I think you know this, great, great people over here that would just love you, would love you, would love to help you just figure out what a relationship with Jesus would look like. But here's what I'm going to do. I, I just, I'm feeling this. If you don't mind, we're going to worship here in a second. Would you all just mind standing to your feet? And we're about to step into worship and, and maybe you're gonna pray with me for other people, but I'm just gonna invite you. Um, if you just could really use faith today. You could just really, just, just not only just that word, but just for God to really just grow your faith today. You're in a season, you're in a situation. You're like, man, I need, I need new eyes. Lord, I need to stand before you just, righteous. I need to start operating like this isn't my home, but that's not where I'm at. If that's you right now, I just want to pray. And if you want to receive, you just want to receive, this isn't from me, it's from him, but I'm just going to pray. If you just want to put your hands out, I'm just going to, I'm just going to invite you to welcome, ask for him to meet you. Like that guy said, Hey, I believe that was a prayer to Jesus. Help me with my unbelief. So if that's you and you just need faith today, and I just invite you to put out your hands. I just wanna pray over you. We're gonna pray over you. Father, thank you that you are who you say you are. Father, thank you that you meet us at that point of reality where you begin to peel back reality and show us what's real and what's true, the, the eternal and the unseen that is backed and behind all things that are visible being. The biggest thing about you is you just love your kids and you love us. And you have wooed us. You have drawn us. You've created all of this and then created a way so that we would come to know you. And so, Father, today we just ask for so many of us, would you just meet us? Father, we believe, but help us, help us in our unbelief. Father, we want to, like Romans 10 be able to say that no one who has ever put their faith in Jesus will ever be put to shame. It just won't happen, can't happen. So Father, we just wanna receive that. We wanna receive and step into faith in new and greater capacities all the time. We pray that in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Let's worship.
right, Southeast fan, thank you so much for being a part of service today. So glad that you're here. My name is Steven, and I am glad that you chose to give us some time today. Love, loved hearing from Trip Lee, and I hope he challenged you today with a message on one of the essentials, or the essential of what it means to be a Christian, and that is where is our faith? What is it we trust above all things when our eyes don't see what lies ahead? Where does our trust go? What do we have faith in? And I loved what Tripp said. One of the little nuggets he said, and there was a lot in there, is our faith is as only as good as the object of our faith is. And who else would our testimony trust? Who else should we trust than the person that was in a grave and walked out of the grave in Jesus? We'd love to talk to you more about that. If you've got questions about Southeast or what that means to have faith, you can always text the word CONNECT to 733733, and we are going to follow up with you about what it means to express faith. Now, at the top of service today, we got to celebrate one of our favorite things as a church. It is Shine Weekend with our Disabilities Ministry. It was Fall Fest, and we were at four locations. We were at our Blanket Baker campus. That's where I'm at right now. But we were also at Crestwood. We were also at Indiana and at Southwest Campus. So we've got some guys and gals joining us from those campuses to take us behind this amazing Shine Fall Fest. Mike, you're right at our Crestwood campus with one of our staff members, Amy. Tell us all about the Crestwood Shine Fall Fest. Yeah, that's right, Stephen. I'm here at Crestwood. Uh, Amy is on the Crestwood campus team, uh, and I grew up out here in Crestwood, so I love that this event uh, was in this community this year. Amy, can you tell us a little bit about just what you experienced at Shine Fall Fest, and what does it mean for this to happen in Crestwood? Yes. It was such a fun and exciting time to just welcome our adults with um, intellectual disabilities to come in and party with us, hang out, share the love of Jesus. We had bingo and prizes, um, dancing, karaoke. We just had so much fun and it was a great time for us to just be together as a community. Yeah, what a beautiful picture there, uh, Mike and Amy, what Crest was able to do. Yeah, and I love our community ministry because it's one of the unique ways we get to partner with our community is through the Shine Disabilities Ministry uh, because it reaches so many unique families with unique needs in our community. We got Sarah with a couple of our volunteers um, at our Indiana campus. So Sarah, tell us all about their perspective of what happened at the Fall Fest there. Hey, Steven. Yeah, I'm with Paul and Marie Deal. So we are here at the Indiana campus. Paul and Marie have been coming to Indiana for a few years, but this is the first year they actually got involved with Shine and with Shine Fall Fest. So Marie, I wanted to ask you, what made you even want to start volunteering with Shine in the first place? Sure, absolutely. So um, we have a son who is autistic. Uh, he's 23 years old now, but that was one of the major reasons when we found out that Southeast um, actually has a room um, where children with special needs can come um, and the parents can actually um, come to service and um, enjoy service um, and they know their kids are safe. Um, that was a huge, huge factor for why we uh, ended up volunteering. I love that so much. And Paul, what keeps you coming back, you know, week after week to volunteer with Shine? Uh, it's really it's just the smile on those kids' faces every day when we get in there and we see them. And also the fact that I know that we're allowing the parents time to just sit and uh, enjoy the sermon and, and worship and sit, soak in God's Word. Yeah, Stephen, that's such a great point. Yep. Like, I love that our church has Shine available for not only, you know, yep. our kids with special needs, but also just for parents just to enjoy worship and have, you know, their kids taken care of and not have to worry so much about that. Oh, absolutely. And the theme this year was mm -hmm. the 1950s uh, sock hop theme. And so they had tons of fun with it. Uh, special thanks to our volunteers there. And then uh, we've got Derek at Southwest with one of our special friends, Hayden. He's a part of the Shine ministry, and he's also a part of SC Online, gets to participate uh, with us, and we love Hayden. So, Derek, uh, love to tell us a little bit about Hayden's experience at Southwest with our Shine Fall Fest. Yeah, guys, this is Hayden Redman at our Southwest Campus Pine of the Shine Ministry, one of my good friends. We've been in a group together online. It's been great getting to know him. But Hayden, it looked like you guys had an awesome time on Friday night here at Southwest. What were some of your favorite things that you got to do? Well, Derek, I will say we did have a great time, you know, and some of the favorite things I got to do was sing karaoke and called bingo with Joan Val and the dance. That's awesome. Well, just looking at your Facebook pictures from Friday night, it looks like you guys had a blast. But Steven, as Hayden's making his SE Online debut this weekend, there was one thing he's been yep. dying to say all weekend. And so Hayden, take it away, buddy. Steven, back to you. Oh, 
Well done. <laughs> Thank you to all our participants there. Hayden, love you. And I can only imagine how good those dance moves were on Friday night. So that's good. Good to see you all. I uh, love getting to celebrate Shine Fall Fest. One of the unique parts of what makes Southeast special is our Shine friends. So, so thankful for that. Hey, online guys, I want to let you know a couple quick things before we sign off from here. I want to remind you, we're only 12 days away from homecoming happening on this campus where I am standing. If you've ever been looking for the weekend to come to Louisville, Kentucky and see Southeast and meet your online family, homecoming's the weekend for you. We got events happening on Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday. We'll be worshiping right here at the Blanket Baker campus. Text homecoming to 733-733. We cannot wait to see you. Also, we got a study coming out next month. It's on the Book of Ruth. We're calling it the Extraordinary Ordinary. It's what happens when we have faith, like Tripp talked about today. When we have faith like that in our ordinary lives, God can do some extraordinary things. To see all the ways to engage, you can text the word Ruth to 733-733, and we are doing a large group together. You can sign up there by texting the word Ruth because it's going to be led by me and Derek and Brandon and Sarah, and we'd love to see a couple hundred of you join us for four weeks as we go through the book of Ruth called The Extraordinary Ordinary. Y'all, that's all I've got for me today. Thank you so much for being a part of Southeast Online. If you learned something today, don't sit on it. If you see a call to action that God has placed in your life, can I encourage you to take that step of faith? Don't delay, sign up, take action, and do the thing that God has called you to do. Y'all, we'll see you back next week. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.